Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first coffee break of 2022. It's Steve Barrett here, editorial director of PR Week, and um, yeah, happy New Year, everyone. So, you know what's ahead of us uh, in 2022? Who knows? But we'll be tracking it for you at PR Week. Got a great guest for you today to kick the year off. It's Thomas Gensimer, who's the chief strategy officer at Public Policy Holdings Holding Company. So, hi, Thomas, and welcome to Coffee Break. Good to see you. Happy New Year. I can't match the enthusiasm in the voice, but I'll try. I'm, I'm dragging that enthusiasm out of the pits after a two. The sun is shining in New York, so is, um, we actually. have a reason to be. It's it about really time. Yeah, we're, we're both in Brooklyn, not that far away from each other. Now, Thomas, we sort of remember you from Blue States, and uh, that was then uh, uh, folded into or acquired by WPP, and you were part of Burson Marstella. But now you're Chief Strategy Officer at a relatively new holding company, which has just gone public on the London Stock Exchange. So tell us all about public policy holding. Sure. Well, it's um, it's new to the new to the public. It's actually been a platform, an emerging platform for about five years. I had met um, a number of my colleagues at the holding company level um, through WPP. They used to be part of Ogilvy PR. Um, and they had merged um, a couple of big lobbying firms uh, to kick it off. Um, so Forbes, Tate, and Crossroads Strategies, which uh, essentially grew out of the Federalist Group, the WPP tie. Forbes, Tate was a standalone independent, brought together a sort of legacy Republican shop, legacy Democratic shop, and built quietly sort of one of the bi biggest in, in Washington. We added a couple of other entities on the public affairs side over years. Eric Smith, an old colleague of mine from my start in politics, um, who has seven letter in Washington, a couple of other things, and then another big lobbying firm. Um, we had become the biggest in town, but uh, only when we did the, the, the IPO in recent weeks uh, was it sort of known because of the public nature of it. Yeah, and in December, you went public on the London Stock Exchange. So tell us a we bit did. about that. And you now have a market cap of $146 million. So tell us about the thinking behind that and uh, what... The thinking what sort of ties to um, some of our shared WPP experiences. Um, Stuart Hall, the founder and CEO um, and friend of mine, as I mentioned, sold his business to Martin Sorrell and team, uh, you know, eight years before... Um, I did with my partners at Blue State. Um, similar earn out sort of cash deals, uh, good, good for founders, good for organizations, but probably, even as, even as um, Martin says now with S4, all earn outs are, are sort of past their sell by date, I think was his, his quote. And I'm always one to, one to quote um, someone smarter than I. So I, Martin Sorrell is definitely that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and we had the same thing in that after um, the four or five years of one's earn out, you're, there wasn't a, a sort of stock incentive or, or a way of building a longer term. So we spent some time, once you reach a certain scale, um, that you have both stability and, and, and some investment grade. They looked at private equity options. They looked at other things. And they thought part of the talent model of keeping the high-end client servicing um, entities together requires more than ordinary income. Um, so followed law firms, followed things. So in, in Europe, law firms are going public. Not all, but you know the, the, some of the laws. The, the U.S. bar um, apparently doesn't allow for it yet. I don't quite understand all the dynamics, but we were following um, the professional services industry of past and saying, how do you convert a big partnership and build it for the long term versus a um, relatively quick exit that, that are now offer, offers? Yeah. And tell us about the type of work you do. It's a mixture of public affairs work and uh, and lobbying as well. So what's the mix? And, and tell us. So it's a lobbying head that, you know, currently of the five operating entities, three include federal lobbying firms. So it's still about two thirds lobbying. Um, although the interesting thing when I say what Stuart sold to WPP versus what I sold to WPP in those eras, when we still were reporting to different people and sort of corporate reputation wasn't touching marketing and all of this, a lot has changed. So as we see in the delivery of the average government relations contract today, they've got to be equipped with some research. They, they may have to activate around some media. They have to do high touch 
um, you know, media affairs. So it is a lot of integrated work, though so much of it is still disclosed on open secrets, you know, under under the brands of the independent entities, right? There's more than 2,000 federal lobbyists in DC that report every month or every quarter on behalf of their clients. So two thirds of the revenue um, is, is, you know, roughly speaking is in that and more and more of the cross sell and upsell into, into the public affairs businesses is cr are creating more and more integrated solutions for clients. Yeah, so Stuart's business was kind of eventually part of Ogilvy government relations. That's right. Yours was part of Burson Masteller. How much of the well, Blue State yeah. stands alone. I moved over to Burson with a number, oh, of, okay. with a number of clients and such, but I had the experience of both doing the sell in to what was WPP Digital, um, and then working at the global network that was Burson. Got it. How much of the work would you say back then was lobbying in, in those two? You know, it's interesting. I, I think um, lobbying was, was downstairs. We still had a lobbying shop within Burson and Marsteller um, that was, you know, a couple of floors down from Don Barrow and I. And we we would say how much we should be working together. But in ways, there weren't the, the cross sell and incentive um, opportunities to to bring those client relationships together. We all, you know, for whatever reason, operated in our in in somewhat silos. Um, I think what we found early on in lessons taken out of that is our businesses now, though at a very different scale than WPP, we admit, um, are incentivized to cross sell. So we can we can build in referral bonuses and build in just integrated client solutions that you know are more than just on the spreadsheet of the reporting entity. So I know that a lobbyist is is is, is well equipped with a piece of research so let's put that in <laughs> and, and and really inform the sales force on how to do it we'd love to have coffee and talk about how we should be working with the lobbyists downstairs at prime policy group but i can't remember a time that we did much of it you know where we did direct impact the brand that was within burson i don't know what it goes by today but was sort of state public affairs integrated you know issues management so whether it was reported on a lobbying disclosure form is sort of dependent, you know, dependent on the jurisdiction. Um, if we did federal lobbying, you know, rarely was it under the WPP banners. You can just see how those lobbying shops of yesteryear are no longer as active or as big as they were when purchased by WPP. Um, we know already as we've grown from just lobbying into the public affairs work that there's great channels for growth and that the work to be effective demands more and more integrated solutions. And what would you say that is the main difference between lobbying and public affairs or PR? I mean, legally speaking, it's about the disclosures. I mean, if we're being quite, you know, I we sit in New York and I know at the state level, which has very active and, 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 and successful lobbying businesses with integrated, um, you know, campaigning units, um, there it depends on how, how Albany defines it. In recent years, if you're starting to buy social media advertising against an issue on the public on the on the legislative agenda, it's disclosed as lobbying. So technically speaking, that's that's you know what our lobbyists do, both in subject matter expertise or or political expertise, is work with um, elected officials and staff to to understand client interests. Like they, they serve as really the force multiplier of corporate, you know, typically Fortune 500 brand and their representation in Washington. Um, when you build what I call the surround sound around it, to both both do issue information, coalition building, um, other other forms of um, corporate reputation, building that sort of arsenal around for either a proactive or defensive stance, that's where the public affairs work comes in. Um, it, it, it's dependent on the client and issue where, where the line is drawn or where the budget is better spent, but certainly the toolbox is a shared one. I mean, lobbying sometimes is, is considered a bit of a dirty word, not to put too fine a point on it. What would you say about that perception and what is the value of, of um, ethical lobbying? Having having just gone through the um, investor roadshow, both with U.S. and international investors, and explaining a lot of this, the 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 fact versus fiction on it is you you hear about lobbyists or special interests when they run afoul of reporting, <laughs> but when when you truly are in the middle of 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 whatever sort of legacy the organization is, all of the um, you know, leading firms in Washington and state capitals are usually pretty bipartisan, usually representing sort of deep client interests and expertise in certain industry sectors. Where, for example, we don't do much FARA work. I mean, the, the, the something for Ottawa, Canada, I think is the only thing we've done in the past five years on a FARA. For our audience, that means a foreign, the, you know, disclosures 
of foreign of foreign Working actors. Foreign entity, yeah. um, we do very little politics, if, if any, on a political cycle. So I think they're more and more akin to the corporate law firms um, and the and and the corporate consultancies than the political operatives that we think of. Now, as I mentioned. Um, the, the, the staff often comes off of directly off of Capitol Hill, um, even some elected officials. So that sort of rotating door is, is true, just as it is in public affairs, though. I worked with a lot of congressional staffers when I worked at Burson Marsteller who were issue specialists. Right. So um, as I as you know, as we get from fact to fiction and again, look at places like Open Secrets, um, and look at the corporate interests that many of these, the leading firms serve. Um, one, it's a constitutional right to have the voice in Washington. And two, it's been in practice in the U.S. and highly disclosed, you know, for, for decades. We, we, explaining this to Europeans is interesting because you have a lot more scandals in, in London, for example. Scandals, I say, media, you know, media moments um, on all sides because there isn't the disclosure regime. There isn't the sort of quarterly client side reporting of, 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 of all your activities. Um, but the U.S. system actually has been more sound than, than anything else. Yeah, interesting stuff. And you mentioned bipartisanship. Obviously, your background was in the Obama uh, administration, very uh, cutting edge with social media and, and digital communication. Generally, Blue State was all Democratic, Democratic establishment, yeah. unions, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. But now you're in more of a bipartisan shop. Two questions. One, how, how do you how do you do that in practice? And, and two, how has the, the world changed? Because you were leading edge at that time. And some would say that the Democratic Party kind of missed that when you, you know, in future uh, campaigns. How, how have things moved on? I, I mean, I, I think on the talent level, it's still there's there's a, a lot of Washington business is still you're a Democratic operative or you're a Wash, you know, or you're a Republican operative. If you're in the campaigning, campaigning technology, creative side of things, there's there's, you know, good shops that have strong partisan you know, partisan uh, capabilities. More and more pursuing corporate work as well. I mean, I think I was early, we were early with Blue State of saying, hey, how do you apply tactics to Ford Motor Company and to Harvard University and to, you know, all of these um, and even to international? So I like to think that we were early in, in bridging that, that, that gap. Um, I will say, though, um, the, the corporate players in Washington, People think, oh, it should, it, it must be all, you know, fossil fuels and, and energy companies. Well, you know, a Amazon was probably the biggest spender last year. Not, not, not for us necessarily, but if we look at all of the where the corporate voices are and where the where the um, concerns have moved, right? Um, there aren't as easy targets. I think there's a lot of good progressive energy in Washington now around Biden, but it's um, it, it's finding its balancing act. And the talent that's within it um, has to be pragmatic. And so a lot of the businesses have found their way of doing both good democratic work and, and, and corporate work uh, in an artful mix. Um, I, I, so, so the purity contest may be coming to a close as there's more and more stable businesses coming out. Not as many are willing to do the ups and downs. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, tactically what has changed, I think will just the, 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 the power of social media um, and the fact that the power, you know, is more in their hands to determine what is within play and what is not. Um, we were really good as Dems in raising money and raising awareness. We also didn't cross a moral line into into doing in, in, into trading and misinformation. Um, and and yeah. Yeah, which is something that's exploded since, right. since that time. And we can't say it's all, or you know, it's not. It, it, look what this week, this weekend with Marjorie Taylor Greene is really interesting. Like her congressional count remains, and her personal count is banned forever. Um, that's all power is then on the West Coast to tech leads as to how we will play in the future. Just to quickly finish, you went uh, live on the London Exchange. What yeah. are the plans for 2022 and developing the business and, and how are you going to? Uh, so I think the part on? of the part of the I mean, the reason for the IPO is to raise capital to more aggressively grow. So we're really moving into an M&A. Um, we have seen the traditional players move out of this space. 
um, you know, both in the lobbying and, and in the sort of specialty or even boutique public affairs as they've gone more and more towards CMO, you know, marketing comms, et cetera. Um, so we think there's a, there's a, we, we can make a market in, in ways that hasn't seen both in Washington, state capitals, international capitals, um, but specific really to public affairs, um, public policy issues management. Um, so we, we will de be deploying uh, the capital in M&A. Um, so doors open to, to, to founders and executives out there who are looking. Um, I, I think the reality of the bipartisan nature is as government grows, um, so does so does the industries around it. So we feel good about the organic growth in all of our businesses. And then to your earlier point, the integrated cell. Clients are looking for more and more, um, both one throat to choke on managing their issues um, and subject matter expertise that go beyond just what you know boutique shops can do. So we think we offer the, the a unique breadth as a platform um, to, to deliver this sort of guaranteed service for the client. We really see ourselves more and more like law firms, accounting agencies, um, auditors um, than, than anything else. All right, Thomas. Well, great to catch up. Good way Likewise. to start the new year. Exciting. Good to time. start the year. Enjoy the sun in Brooklyn today. And, yeah, uh, and it was raining up. all all through the holidays, and now we're back at work. It's sunny, but uh, hey, that's life. <laughs> all right. Well, good luck. Um, great to see you again. Coffee for real uh, in person post all of this. Absolutely. All right. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye.